Our uh, text this morning for the sermon is Acts chapter 4 and verse uh, 12. But I'd like to read this passage in in its context, so I'll back up to uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And would you please listen carefully to this? This is God's word. Now, this is speaking about Peter and John and uh, the evangelism that they were doing before uh, the, the people of Israel, just so you know who they are as we begin this. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I think that as Christians, one of the most difficult things that the Lord has given us to do, and I think you can testify or you can, you can bear witness from your own experience, one of the most difficult things that God has given us to do, I think, is evangelize. Not the only thing that's difficult. He's given us a number of difficult things. It's hard to put our sins to death. It's hard to give up the world. It's hard to pursue the things of the Lord alone and to have a heart that is single for the Lord. That's difficult. That that has to do with overcoming the old man and the flesh. But of course, we have to do that before we can do this. And this is the one thing that we're most reluctant to do, to share Jesus Christ with others. And the reason is because we know how they're going to respond to us. You know, we're we're social creatures. God has made us to be social creatures. We like friends. We like to spend time with people. We like to talk to other people. And we know that when we talk to them about Jesus Christ, it's going to disrupt some of that uh, socializing. Uh, They're not going to like us anymore. They won't want to have much to do with us anymore. Uh, We we don't like to share Christ because it, it makes people angry at us especially when you tell them that they need to repent of their sins, that they need to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to Him. I mean, that's asking them to do quite a bit, and most people don't want to do that. And, of course, it makes matters only worse when they understand that if they don't do this, they're going to end up in hell. You think, I'm going to hell. That doesn't exactly win friends and influence people. Nobody likes conflict, and evangelism almost always invites conflict. But now what is it that we see in our passage? We see the disciples evangelizing the Jewish people. We see the apostles evangelizing the Jewish leaders uh, even after they were arrested knowing that this was certainly going to mean further conflict and persecution for them. In other words, the thing that we don't like the most is the thing that they were inviting to themselves through their preaching of the gospel to these leaders. Now, why were they willing to do this? 
before the same people and before the same leaders who had only a few months earlier taken the Lord Jesus Christ, put him on trial, condemned him, and crucified him with the very real possibility that they would do exactly the same thing to them. Why were they willing to do this? Well, for one thing, Jesus commanded them to do this. It was their duty. And certainly, if they loved the Lord at all, they had to do their very best to get that message out. But another very important reason why they were doing this is I think one of the reasons why Paul did it. Because he loved them. Even though they were enemies, even though they had crucified the Lord, they understood that was a part of God's plan to bring salvation. But they cared about those people. They cared about them enough to preach the gospel to them, even though this possibility existed of persecution. Jesus commanded them to do this. Jesus wanted them, of course, to do this because Jesus also tells us in Scripture that he has a concern for all men, that all would repent and turn to him in faith. Now, that is true, notwithstanding, you know, the idea of election. We do believe election is true, but it also says in Scripture that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He also says he takes no death in the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his sins and be saved. Now, Jesus commanded them to do this because he realized that the only hope for anyone in the world to be saved from their sins was to trust in him. He is the only hope for the world. Now, I think to understand this is very important. I think sometimes we, especially when it comes down to um, the opportunities that we have to evangelize others, we often think about the fact that, uh, or we think anyway, that, that these people are okay, or they're going to hear the gospel down the line, or maybe they've already trusted Jesus Christ, or maybe they're not so bad. I mean, there's all this myriad of excuses that come into our minds to get us not to tell others about Jesus Christ, besides the ones I've already mentioned, which is the conflict it can bring and the anger and so forth and the disruption of our relationships. We don't want that to happen. So all these things fight against us as we, as we seek to bring Christ to others. So how do we combat that? Well, I think we have to be reminded of the necessity of the gospel, of the fact that people are lost without the gospel, that they're going to be condemned unless they trust in Jesus Christ. They actually are going to end up in hell. We need to be reminded of that. So let's think about that for a few moments this morning. Now, the Bible, as you know, says that God originally uh, made man good, which means, among other things, that God made man in his image. And he made him to love the things that are good, even as God does. Now, he gave man also a perfect place to live and basically gave man everything that he needed, not only to sustain his life, but also to glorify and serve him. And the Bible even says that God would come down and walk with the man in the, uh, in the evening and have fellowship with him. But the Bible also tells us that things did not stay this way. That the Lord had actually determined to put uh, man on trial and to put him under a test Sometimes it's hard to concentrate when there's too much uh, sound going on. The Lord had determined when he put man in the garden to um, not, not to allow the situation that man was, was in uh, to continue uh, forever, as it were. He put him into the garden for a particular reason. And that reason was to put him on trial, to put him under a test to see whether or not he would obey the Lord. And if you understand the Bible, you understand that this test that God put the man under was not just for himself, but it was also for us, for all humanity. 
to determine whether or not God would take basically Adam and all of his children and confirm them in the condition that they were actually in in the garden, which is this, well, this relationship with God, this life that would continue on in fellowship with God with this desire in order to serve him. You see, if, if Adam, who is the first man, had actually passed that test, he would have lived forever with God in paradise. He would have never actually been alienated from the Lord at all. Now, the test, of course, that the, that the Lord gave the man was quite simple. He was given permission to eat from any tree in the garden, but of one tree, he said, do not eat of that tree. All he had to do to pass the test was not to eat of that tree, no matter what happened. God even warned him and told him what would happen if he did eat of the tree. Of the day that you eat from this, you will surely die. Die not just physically, but also eternally. Now, you know, the fact is, God knows all things, doesn't he? There's nothing that takes him by surprise. Was he surprised when Adam failed that test and ate of the tree and fell into sin and condemned the whole human race? No. God knew exactly what the man was going to do, that he would disobey him, that he would fall away. But God also knew what he was going to do about it. And you know, of course, again, that man did fall away. And he became, well, alienated from God. Man ate of the tree. Man became sinful. Man became guilty. All of his children became guilty and sinful. All of them uh, were born into the world. All of us were born into the world with a dislike for God, with a hatred against God. All of the war, all the disease, all the suffering, all the death that we see going on in the world and we have seen going on throughout all the centuries were the result of this. But you see, that's not the worst part. The worst part is that man died not only physically and brought all of this upon himself, but being liable now to God's justice. He was liable to hell. I told you that God told Adam, the day that you eat from this, you will surely die. Adam did not just drop to the ground dead after he ate of the tree, but rather he began to age so that he would eventually physically die, even though at a very late age. But he also died judicially. He became guilty in God's court, and he became liable to eternal death. That was the result of the fall. Everyone who dies in this condition actually is liable to this punishment. You know, the Bible tells us that this, what we see going on in the world right now as far as physical life, I mean, we see people live, we see people die. This isn't all that is going on. This is just the beginning. The Bible tells us that after we die, that we are still uh, very conscious of who we are, of what we've done. We're also aware of the condition that we're in, whether we're happy or not happy, whether we're comfortable or uncomfortable, whether things are pleasant or whether we're suffering, whether we're experiencing pleasure or pain. Those who die in their sins, the Bible says, God exacts payment upon them or judgment upon them after they die, and they have to pay for those crimes. The Bible says that God is just, that he can't just overlook sin. God has to punish sin. But there is no punishment that man can really endure that would ever satisfy God's justice because the sins we've committed are committed against an infinite God. And so the punishment that God must inflict because he is just must be an infinite punishment, which means it must go on forever. And that is what hell is all about. Hell, the Bible tells us, is a place of suffering. It's a place of darkness. It's a place where people weep and where they gnash their teeth or they grind their teeth because of the pain. It's a place of burning where the soul is tormented and that suffering goes on forever and ever. 
Bible tells us that there's absolutely no escape from this place, that it's a place of utter despair and hopelessness. Perhaps you've heard of some of those illustrations of eternity to give you an idea of how long the suffering goes on. Uh, if, if the entire earth were, were simply a big ball of sand and every million years a bird came by and brushed off one of the grains of sand, the time it would take for the bird to whittle the earth down to nothing would be just a moment in the amount of time that is stretching before you. In hell, there's a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, because the suffering goes on forever and ever. And again, the reason is because the sins that all of us have committed are against an infinitely worthy God, and just one sin would be enough to uh, require that we suffer forever and never fully pay off that debt. You see, this is the predicament that we are in. This is why we need salvation, is because if nothing is done to change that situation, we are guilty enough to go into that fiery place forever. But again, we're talking about the hope of the gospel and why we believe the gospel is the only hope. The gospel actually gives us hope. The word gospel means good news. Uh, everyone was on their way to hell. Everyone had no hope, but God did something about it. Uh, while we were still alienated, while we were still his enemies, God sent his son into the world to provide a way of escape. Now, Jesus did everything that was necessary in order for us to be saved. He did everything. He lived the life that we were called to live by God, which is a life of perfection. Jesus never sinned. He said on one occasion to his enemies, which one of you convinces me of sin? Have I done anything wrong? Can you accuse me justly? Now, they accused him. They brought false witnesses against him. But no one could ever accuse him of any crime because Jesus actually had done everything perfectly right. He lived a perfect life. But he also went to the cross, as you know, and he died on the cross. He took the death sentence that was meant for sin upon himself. And he suffered on the cross. And he died in the place of those who would put their trust in him. So that as we've already read in John 3.16, they would not perish. That is, they would not be cast into that fire forever and ever. But they would have eternal life. They would be brought safely to heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the Bible says that we are the ones who rebelled against God. It was man that disobeyed God and fell into sin. And so the one who would make this payment for us had to be man. The son of God becomes a man to take our place so that he might save us. The Bible says the debt that we owe to God's justice was, was greater than anyone could pay. I mean, we already saw that to pay for those sins means to suffer in hell forever. Well, the one then who had to make that payment for us, I should say the one who did make the payment, had to be infinitely great so that he could pay that debt. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is. He is the Son of God who is infinitely worthy, who became a man to pay the payment that we owed and to do it with such value that it could wipe out our debt and the debt of really countless people. The payment that he made is enough. Now the gospel is simply the message of what God has done through his son to provide salvation for sinful man. But now the point of what Peter was preaching to these Jewish people and to these Jewish leaders was this, Jesus is the way that he's provided, but he is the only way that he has provided. Jesus is the only uh, way that God has provided to save sinful man. Again, look at verse 12 of Acts chapter 4. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 
And this, of course, is what I want you to see this morning. All mankind, the Bible tells us, is guilty and is sinful. Everyone has fallen short, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You have done so, I have done so. We all came into this world under the sentence of death, under the sentence of hell. And you and I would have been cast into that fiery furnace forever on the day of judgment if it were not for this, this one way out. Now again, it's very common today to treat everyone's religion as basically equal. So many people believe that the world religions are just so many spokes that lead to one hub, and that is God. You can take the way of Islam and be saved. You can be a Mormon and be saved. You can be a Jehovah's Witness or a faithful Buddhist or a Hindu. You can even worship trees and rocks. You can be an animist. It doesn't matter. God will still accept you. And of course, you know, things are just getting worse. So many people today believe you don't have to believe in religion at all. You know, God loves all men and he wants everyone to be saved. And even the atheist who goes through life denying God, not thanking God, not recognizing God, but rejecting everything he knows about God through the creation and lives his life in abject sin. Even that person is going to end up in heaven eventually because God is planning to save everyone. Now you realize that there are countless people who are in hell right now who once believed that that was true, but they don't believe that anymore because now they see the truth. Now here's the question I would put to you, and I think we all see that this is the case. Consider what it is that God did in order to save sinful man. Consider what it is that he put his son through, such a horrible death such a difficult life. Would God have done that if there were any other way? Would he have sent Jesus Christ to live among those who hate him? Would he have had him betrayed by one of his own, one of his close associates, and had him put on trial and publicly condemned? Would he have had his, his son whipped mercilessly as he was and have his flesh ripped open? or have the, th the crown of thorns you know, placed upon his head, his face beaten? Would he have had him go through such public humiliation? Would he have, and this is even greater, laid the sins of his people and charged them to his account and then punished Jesus Christ on the cross for those sins, make him suffer hell on the cross for those sins if he was intending to allow people to come to him in any way that they chose. Now the reason why Peter was preaching to these people and the leaders of Israel and the reason why Paul evangelized the whole Roman Empire, the reason why he was willing to suffer so many things at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles, and the reason why so many believers over the years, over the centuries, have given their lives to get the gospel out to people who lived around them as well as people in foreign lands is because of what Peter says in our passage this morning. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way of salvation. If you don't believe that, then you are going to perish. If you don't trust him, if you don't turn from your sins, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to him as your Lord, the Bible says you will perish. But the good news is if you will trust him, if you will receive him, if you will surrender your life to him and submit to him as your Lord to follow him and serve him all, all your days from your heart, you will be saved. As a matter of fact, if you can do that, you are saved. The Lord will forgive all of your sins. I mean, just one sin would be enough to condemn you forever. He will wipe out all sins, all of your past sins, including the sin of Adam, 
all the sins you've committed since you've come into this world, all the sins that you will commit before you leave this world. He'll blot them all out. And he will do better than give you a clean slate. He will give you a perfect record of righteousness, of obedience. He will give you the obedience of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will give you a perfect place to live in perfect love and happiness for the rest of time. And he will take care of you for the rest of time and love you as his own son and daughter if you will only trust in his son and turn from your sins and follow him. That sounds like a wonderful alternative to endless stretches of time of suffering and torment because we are unwilling to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ because we're unwilling to receive the free gift that he offers to us of his son. Now let me just close with a reminder for those of you who perhaps have not received the Lord Jesus Christ and still are not inclined to do so. Usually you have a reason for doing something like that. I'm okay with God. He's going to accept me. Or God doesn't exist. But realize that a day is coming when you will see for yourself that these things actually are true. But on that day, when you see it face to face, it's going to be too late to do anything about it. And you're going to be very sorry that you did not listen to those numerous times that you had heard the gospel and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ while you still had opportunity. Don't let that happen to you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, but trust in him. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he offers to save you now. The Lord, when he went about preaching in Israel, said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He also said, The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. You don't have to be afraid that Jesus is going to reject you. If you come to him, he tells you to come. He offers to be your savior. He offers to free you from all the things that will destroy you. And he will even give you a place in his own family and love you more than anyone has ever loved you before. That is his free offer. And if you will just receive him this morning, he will do that for you. So don't let another Lord's Day go by, another uh, gospel message go by and, and just sort of chalk it up to, I've heard that before and I'm okay. You're not okay if you haven't trusted Jesus. You're on your way to hell if you haven't trusted Jesus. If you die and you haven't trusted Jesus, you will enter into hell and you will never escape it. But if you will trust Jesus now, he will save you and he will bring you safely to heaven. So trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him now. There is no other way. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. So come through that door to God. Trust in him and he will save you. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply uh, what we've heard to us and uh, to give us the grace to trust in him.